In part two of this Tech Corner series, we are continuing to look at file storage for photographers and how to set up a RAID and a NAS. In part one of this series, we covered the most common RAID configurations available for home and SME use, as well as the advantages and disadvantages of each RAID configuration. In this video, I will cover the various options available to set up your own RAID drive. RAID is simply a way of combining multiple physical drives into a single drive that offers improved performance, reliability, or both. So how do we do that? The simplest way to have a RAID setup is by using an external RAID enclosure. The enclosures come in a variety of sizes from two drives to five drives and more. Every enclosure supports different RAID configurations and different interfaces such as USB, Thunderbolt and Ethernet to connect them to a computer. An enclosure with an Ethernet port is typically known as a NAS or a Network Attached Storage. Please note that a NAS doesn't necessarily have to be a RAID. Enclosures with support for two drives will typically offer RAID 0 or RAID 1 since all other RAID configurations require more than two drives. These enclosures also offer a JBOD configuration which we haven't looked at yet. JBOD essentially just combines all the drives into one large drive without any RAID advantages. In a JBOD configuration, all the drives appear as a single drive on the computer, but they are filled sequentially, meaning as one drive fills up, data automatically overflows to the next drive. This is not a configuration I recommend using. Most of these budget enclosures have a selector switch that allows you to set up the RAID configuration. When the enclosure is powered on, after a new configuration is selected, all the drives will be configured for the selected RAID. Keep in mind that any data on those drives will be lost during this setup, so make sure you don't have anything important save on the drives if you are configuring for RAID. Once RAID is set up and the enclosure is connected to your computer via USB or Thunderbolt, you typically have to format the new drive. This process varies between operating systems and is beyond the scope of this video. However, your RAID enclosure should come with instructions on how to do this. More advanced RAID enclosures will come with configuration software where you can not only set up and change the RAID configuration via the software interface on your computer, but the software will also monitor the state of your RAID, alerting you if a drive has failed and requires replacing. A NAS is typically configured with software interface, but connecting to it using your web browser. Again, your NAS will come with specific instructions on how to connect to your NAS. One other option typically found in more advanced RAID enclosures is the option of a hotspare. A hotspare is a drive that sits in the enclosure doing nothing while everything is running properly. If a drive does fail, the hotspare turns on and the RAID rebuilds immediately to that drive, keeping the entire RAID fully operational while you arrange for a replacement drive. When the failed drive is replaced, it then becomes the new hotspare. The advantage of a hotspare is that a RAID can repair itself as soon as a fault is detected. The disadvantage is that for most of the time, you have a drive just sitting there doing nothing. One thing to be aware of is that not all external hard drive enclosures and NAS systems have a RAID controller built in. Although you can set up a software RAID on any drives connected to your computer, RAID can be CPU intensive which will affect your computer's performance. So whenever possible, always choose an enclosure with a RAID controller built in. The other thing to check is the maximum supported drive size. RAID enclosures will have a limit on the maximum size of each drive installed in the enclosure. There is no point buying a 3TB drive only to discover that your enclosure only supports 2TB per drive. So you've purchased your enclosure, you've filled it with drives and configured RAID. Now what? Just about all enclosures will have a USB connection to attach it to your computer. Some come with a Thunderbolt connection, significantly increasing data transfer rates. And then there's NAS. A NAS is essentially a hard drive enclosure that connects to your network instead of directly connecting to your computer. Some NAS systems have basic share functionality only, and others are full media servers, allowing you to play media, run software, backup data, and much more. NAS systems can vary greatly in price depending on the functionality and processing power and are generally much more expensive compared to a standard RAID enclosure. So which should you choose? 
As always, it depends on your needs. A USB or Thunderbolt enclosure will connect to only one computer. That's fine if you work solo, only have the one workstation or laptop, and you are using RAID for storing your media files. The advantage of this setup is that you will get much faster transfer speeds compared to Ethernet and much lower setup costs. The disadvantage is that it is far more difficult, although not impossible, to share the files to your network for access by multiple devices or multiple users. A NAS has significantly higher setup costs, however if you work in a small team where all of you need access to the same files and your network is fast enough, this is by far the most convenient option. Keep in mind that in general you will never get the read and write speeds of a dedicated USB enclosure over a typical home network. So as always there are advantages and disadvantages to both options and you have to make the choice as to which is right for you. Finally, I want to touch on a RAID expansion card if you are running a custom workstation. For this to work, your computer case will need to have enough room to install all the additional drives and your motherboard needs to have a spare compatible PCIe slot. Generally, RAID controller cards are much more powerful compared to the RAID controllers found inside external enclosures and with it running over PCIe, it will offer the best transfer rates. If your computer setup allows, this is by far the best option in terms of performance. While we're on the topic of transfer rates, I want to share with you some tests I did with my RAID drives using Crystal Disk Mark to give you a better idea of how the different options compare. Each test shows sequential read and write as well as random access read and write. Since this video is about building a RAID for your RAW files and video files, I will be focusing mainly on sequential read and write speeds, however I have included the other test results for completeness. To start, here are the read and write speeds of a typical spinning SATA drive connected internally with a SATA connection. Comparing this to RAID 1 running over USB 3, we see an improvement in the sequential read speed, but a small decline in the sequential write speeds. Now let's look at RAID 5 with 5 drives, and you can see how the RAID 5 parity overhead is slowing down the overall performance of the array. If this was an enterprise grade RAID controller, we would be achieving much better results as the controller CPU would be much more powerful, but as I said at the beginning of this series, enterprise grade equipment has been excluded as it is not something many photographers will be investing in. Now remember when I mentioned earlier that having an internal RAID controller significantly helps with data transfer rates? Well here is my RAID 10 running on a dedicated internal RAID controller. Quite a difference across every test isn't it? Up until now all RAID configurations shown are using a standard 7200 RPM spinning drive. With SSD drives getting cheaper by the day, let's see how an SSD compares. Not bad for a single SATA drive. Let's take it one step further and test the RAID 1 SSD running over USB 3.1. This is my portable array that travels with my laptop and I plan to make a video in the future where I show you how you can build this yourself on a relatively small budget. So as you can see from these results, if you can afford building your RAID with SSD drives, you will get significantly increased performance. Keep in mind that SSD drives 2TB and over are still significantly more expensive compared to spinning drives, so it all comes down to your required capacity and budget. It is important to note that these are all SATA drives. NVMe drives offer lightning fast speeds and comparing them to SATA drives is a little unfair. Plus, NVMEs are still on the pricey side compared to SATA and this series is all about relatively budget options. Maybe I can revisit this topic once the cost of NVMe drives falls. So hopefully by now you have a pretty good idea of how RAID works and which configuration best suits your needs. Now you would be forgiven to think that with all the fault tolerance RAID offers, you no longer have to worry about running backups. Sadly, RAID is not a replacement for backing up your data. The job of a RAID is to eliminate downtime and protect against data loss only of projects you are currently working on in the event of a drive failure. So in part 3 of this series I will explore various backup options available to you as well as a backup workflow to keep your data as safe as possible. If you have any RAID questions or want to see my RAID drives in more detail, let me know in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching. 
If you found this video informative, please don't forget to subscribe and press that bell icon so you don't miss out on future videos.